This is a response to Answer Question 1's video reply to Confronting Answer Questions 1, in which I addressed his contentions against Big Bang cosmology. I have to say from the outset that I am very disappointed in AQ's conduct in his reply video, but we will get to that at the end of this video, after I cover all of the science. We have some very interesting topics to cover in this video, including monopoles, the geometry of the universe, and dark energy. Unfortunately, before we get to the interesting science, I'm going to have to burn the straw man that AQ used as the foundation of his argument. You claim that in my video, I said that one incorrect prediction made by the Big Bang was sufficient to debunk it. Of course, I never said any such thing. In fact, I made the opposite clear multiple times in my video. What I did say was that if any of the principal predictions listed here could be debunked, the Big Bang theory could easily be disproved, as these are the centerpieces of that theory. As I mentioned in the previous video, the Big Bang is at worst a very good approximation of how observable reality behaves, and the only viable grounds for abandoning it at this point is by discovering that the data used to reach these conclusions was flawed. Never did I say that, quote, only one incorrect prediction is sufficient to disprove it, end quote. If you think that I did, AQ, I challenge you to publish the timestamp in which I said that. You'll find, of course, that you cannot because I did not, and when we reach the topic of the universe's geometry, we're going to look carefully at how a statement such as, one incorrect prediction made by the Big Bang can disprove it, holds up against the actual manner in which science operates. As it happens, AQ, none of the predictions made by the Big Bang Theory are unaccounted for, but you contested that point by claiming the following. 1. The Big Bang Theory predicts that there are monopoles in the universe, but none have ever been found. Therefore, the Big Bang Theory should be abandoned. First of all, AQ, the Big Bang Theory makes no such prediction. Grand unified theories are what predicted monopoles, not the Big Bang. Second of all, it has been known since the early 1980s that an inflationary model of the Big Bang is able to account for the lack of observed monopoles, which are hypothetical particles with only one magnetic pole. One of the consequences of this model is that the density of monopoles is incredibly low, with some research suggesting that there may be as few as one in the entire universe. It is therefore unsurprising that monopoles have not yet been detected, nor, in all likelihood, will they be for a very long time. But let's apply your logic to other theories, AQ, so that we can get a grasp of just how unreasonable your expectations are. You expect that just because we have not yet discovered one of the fundamental particles associated with this extremely robust and extremely reliable theory, we should abandon it. But what about gravitational theory and quantum theory, AQ? In order to reconcile quantum mechanics and gravity, physicists have proposed a boson called the graviton. The graviton has never been observed, however, so should we abandon quantum theory and gravitational theory? Physicists have also proposed hypothetical particles called X and Y bosons that regulate interactions between quarks and leptons, yet those have never been discovered either. Do you propose that we abandon atomic theory on this basis? AQ, if you're willing to dismiss the Big Bang Theory over something this arbitrary, then you should also be willing to abandon gravitational, quantum, and atomic theory. Pointing to gaps in our understanding of a particular aspect of a theory does not constitute a compelling argument against it. In any case, magnetic monopole quasi-particles have already been found and experimented with in the field of condensed matter physics, and these particular species of monopole differ only superficially from the ones predicted by grand unification theories. So to summarize, the Big Bang Theory does not incorrectly predict an abundance of monopoles because A. It does not even predict their existence in the first place, other theories do that, and b, their extreme rarity is already accounted for by inflation. 2. According to you, the Big Bang Theory predicts that the cosmic background radiation contains inhomogeneities, but in reality, it was in thermal equilibrium. WRONG! <coughs> the Kobe W map and Planck satellites have all independently confirmed that the background radiation has fluctuations in it. If this radiation really was in thermal equilibrium, there would be no structures in the universe just an endless sea of particles distributed uniformly. 3. You also claim that the background radiation is older than the predicted age of the universe. I would really love to know what your sources are for that claim, seeing as everything that I've ever read on the subject unanimously concurs that this radiation formed 380,000 years after the Big Bang. 4. You claim that the Big Bang incorrectly predicts that the universe is flat. No, AQ, that prediction was correct. It is here that I should point out that the Big Bang actually predicted three possible geometries, not just one. 
Science advances by deriving multiple models to account for a particular phenomenon and eliminates inaccurate models as time goes on and data is accumulated. The example of the universe's geometry is a perfect example of this AQ, and your earlier straw man demonstrates your brazen misunderstanding of how science actually operates. Three models were derived, and two of them would inevitably be wrong. Scientists knew this from the outset. To say, therefore, that a single incorrect prediction would disprove the Big Bang Theory when the progress of science is entirely contingent on revising models speaks to the ineptitude of creationism and its childish predilection for false dichotomies. The geometry of the universe is dependent on the ratios of the densities of matter, energy, and dark energy, with different distributions leading to different geometries. The reason for this is that the force responsible for the shape of the universe, gravity, behaves differently under different distributions. The geometry of the universe itself can be measured by looking at the aforementioned fluctuations in the cosmic background radiation, which you previously said did not exist. There are three possible geometries of the universe, each with different consequences for the behavior and the eventual fate of the universe. The first one is an open universe. A triangle on such a surface would have its angles add up to be less than 180 degrees, with average angular distances being half a degree. We can use the Friedman equations to predict other aspects of such a universe. It would be a radiation-dominated universe, and its eventual fate would be to undergo heat death and perhaps even rip open. Parallel lines in this hyperbolic universe would eventually diverge. This is possible in a non-Euclidean system. This means that if you were to travel in one direction indefinitely, you would only move farther away from your starting point. The second possible universe is a closed universe. A triangle on such a universe would have its angles add up to be more than 180 degrees, with average angular distances being a degree and a half. This universe would be matter-dominated, and would undergo a universal oscillation process, where it expands with a big bang before gravity pulls the universe back into a singular state with a big crunch, repeating the cycle indefinitely. In this spherical universe, parallel lines would eventually converge, as the longitudinal lines on a globe do at the poles. And as with on a globe, moving in one direction would eventually return you to your starting point. When the cosmic background radiation satellites brought us the image of the background radiation in the late 90s, scientists measured the angles of the fluctuations in it. The perturbations in the images were produced by ancient pressure waves traveling at a known speed, the speed of light divided by the square root of 3, through the hot ionized gas of the early universe for a known amount of time, 380,000 years, which allows us to obtain the distance to the remnants of an ancient cloud bank called the last scattering surface. Along with the Hubble constant and the path taken by the background radiation, we can use this distance to derive a triangle that spans the universe, allowing us to discern what type of geometry we're living in. And that's how we know that we live in the third type of universe, a flat universe, for the angles of the triangle added up to 180 degrees, and the average angular distance is approximately one degree. This universe's ultimate fate is the same as that of the open universe, that is, the big freeze and the big rip, and parallel lines in this universe stay parallel. Our universe, contrary to what you said in your video, is flat, and using the Friedman equations, we can determine its primary constituent. We live in a dark energy dominated universe. 5. Speaking of dark energy, according to you, the Big Bang initially did not predict the acceleration of the universe. So what? The Big Bang theory never claimed that the recession rate was constant, as you seem to be implying that it did. In fact, it used to be that the most accepted model of the Big Bang theory was the aforementioned oscillating universe model. The reason for this misunderstanding was because the variable of dark energy was unknown at the time, and thus was not taken into account. 6. While we're still on the topic of dark energy, you claim that the redshift in the galaxies can be accounted for solely by dark energy. This is true. According to you, it's possible that the universe just started to expand recently, but was never coiled in a singular state. You also said that dark energy can account for the background radiation. This is not true. And in fact, it's because of the existence of the background radiation, as well as the many predictions that can be derived from it, that we know that the universe began in a singularity. As I pointed out in the previous video, the distribution of mass in the elements, the temperature of the radiation, its average homogeneity and isotropy, and the abundance of helium in the universe all independently concur with the model that posits that the universe used to be incredibly hot and dense. Dark energy by itself cannot account for any of this, but an expansion from a singularity can and does. 7. Speaking of the elemental distribution, you claim that there was too much lithium in the universe to be accounted for by the Big Bang. 
This is only partially true. While lithium-6 is overabundant, lithium-7 is underabundant, which suggests that some form of radioactive decay may have taken place. Other models have been proposed to account for this issue, of course, including a study that argues for a main sequence depletion mechanism. The Big Bang isn't the only factor involved in lithium distribution, AQ, and while lithium's abundance currently poses a perplexing anomaly, it certainly isn't sufficient grounds for dismissing the theory, especially since the rest of the elemental distributions are so successfully accounted for by the Big Bang. This success and others are not a product of coincidence, AQ. These results are statistically significant to the point of obscenity. Once again, no theory is perfect and all require revision. We will return to this point at the end of the video, however, when I berate you for your conduct. 8. You repeated your old argument about the uneven distribution of matter and antimatter, complaining that my rebuttal was based on faith because I assumed that the missing antimatter was in other parts of the universe. What you conveniently forgot to mention was that I showed that we already have precedent to believe this because enormous quantities of antimatter have already been detected in other parts of the galaxy to speak nothing of other galaxies in deep space. I added that we would expect to find this had inflation unevenly separated matter and antimatter. This quote mine would have been bad enough by itself had you not completely ignored what I said immediately afterward. Let me refresh your memory. And even if inflation hadn't unevenly separated matter and antimatter, numerous experiments at the Large Hadron Collider have confirmed that oscillating antiparticles can decay into particles and can do so at a very fast rate which can help explain the uneven distribution. Despite your protestations to the contrary, we have viable models of how energy could have condensed into uneven distributions of matter and antimatter. As you just saw, in that video, I displayed the peer-reviewed articles that deal with this issue, and even linked them in the description. When I looked at your history, though, it occurred to me that this second quote mine may merely have been an oversight on your part, after all, you managed to do all of your research and recording for your latest video merely two hours after watching a video that I'd spent an entire night producing, and many hours reviewing. Before I go on though, I just want to play a short clip from your video. I can think of many incorrect predictions. You then proceeded to list the aforementioned arguments, starting with the monopole argument. Interestingly enough, on the Big Bang page in Answers in Genesis, their very first argument against the evidence for the Big Bang is, you guessed it, missing monopoles. What a mysterious coincidence. It's almost as if immediately after watching my video, rather than follow my sources, you jumped onto your favorite creationist websites and began desperately looking for something to latch onto. Here's the creation wiki page on the Big Bang. Six of the arguments that you presented in our exchange can be found here. Now I realize that you've used some of these arguments in the past, but I sincerely doubt that you thought of them yourself, with the possible exception of some of your more outlandish assertions. I have very good reason to suspect that you did not think of many incorrect predictions and are instead guilty of plagiarism. <laughs> of course, I understand why you wouldn't want to cite your sources, as the last time you were forthcoming about where you got your misinformation, you were rightfully berated for frequenting your two favorite pseudoscientific websites. If you think that this constitutes honest research, AQ, you're out of your mind. This is what a physics paper looks like. This is what a creationist paper looks like. Learn the difference, and don't you dare make any pretensions to intellectual superiority on a matter in which you're clearly scientifically illiterate. What positively pissed me off, however, was the way your video ended. You claimed that my position on the Big Bang was a position of faith, and then claimed that your arguments are not controversial in the scientific community, despite the fact that over half of what you said was demonstrably wrong while the rest is based on misrepresentations, and then asserted that my counter-arguments were just attempts at making the model work by imposing variables. You also accused me of trying to mitigate the problems with the Bang Bang model, echoing your scientific revisionary argument from your first reply. Let's talk about that for a moment. These two arguments are arguments from ignorance, claiming that just because we don't have a full understanding of these phenomena, we should abandon one of the most successful theories in science. To understand why this reflects your ignorance of one of the most fundamental tenets of science, consider the analogy that you've already been given before. 
When Newton first proposed gravity, it was known that his model was unsuccessful in predicting Mercury's orbit. Rather than abandon it, however, the world recognized the statistical significance of its ability to accurately predict results, so it was accepted as imperfect until an explanation could be found. One eventually was discovered by Einstein when he used general relativity to make corrections that accurately predicted Mercury's orbital perturbations. This was not a case of scientists trying to make the model work, which you accused me of doing, but a textbook example of how amending theories drive scientific progress. It's no coincidence, by the way, that the Industrial Revolution followed immediately after the development of Newtonian mechanics. Imagine, therefore, what kind of world we would be living in had people thought like you do, and dismissed Newtonian mechanics on the grounds that it did not perfectly account for all anomalies. These topics aren't being ignored, AQ. They're actively being dealt with by some of the most brilliant minds on the planet, whereas all that a creationist can do is sit on the computer and whine about how a couple of gaps in our understanding of a theory is grounds for its dismissal, whilst hypocritically using a machine that relies on theories with even more fundamental gaps. I know for a fact that this has already been explained to you, AQ, both by myself and by other YouTubers, so it remains a mystery to me as to why you're repeating the same old falsehoods. AQ, there is no excuse for rejecting the Big Bang Theory. It's painfully transparent that your contentions were not intellectually driven, but religiously motivated. Otherwise, your sources would not have been these radical fringe sites. My sources are all scientific and respectable, whereas yours have an extensive track record for lying and misrepresenting science, so it comes as no surprise to me that some of the stench wore off on you. These five arguments were outright falsehoods and irrelevancies, these two contentions were arguments from ignorance, and this one was a double quote mine. Your foundational argument was a straw man, your criticisms of me were rife with projections and invalid arguments from authority, and nearly all of your information was plagiarized. I have no patience and no respect for this sort of dishonorable behavior. I suspect that you're planning to go back to your creationist websites and parrot more arguments against reality, but don't bother. I've already examined each of these arguments in detail, and I can assure you that none of them have any merit. That having been said, this will be my last reply to you, as I've given you far more exposure than you deserve, and you reciprocated by spitting in my face. In addition to a retraction, I also want an apology for your intellectual dishonesty. Until these conditions are met, video communications between us will be terminated indefinitely. I have no patience for dishonesty, AQ. Unfortunately for you, however, that is all that creationism relies upon. Dishonesty.